Fun fact, I have no idea what I'm gonna say. Um, yeah, I'm Chris. Um, fun fact, since I get this question uh, literally every day, uh, I am 6'9". So. Wow, dude's really tall is his fun facts. It's an easy one, I can use it for everything. Um, yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about Gatsby themes. Um, yeah, gonna be a little bit of a casual conversation. We're gonna go over sort of like how other people do themes a little bit, and then we're gonna go into how a Gatsby site actually works, and then how to mechanically uh, use themes in your own work. Um, and somebody asked me earlier uh, whether they would be able to actually build their own themes after this talk, and yeah, basically, um, as of right now, this talk is the most complete documentation that you have for themes. Um, I will be working on that next week, so look forward to those uh, docs. But uh, I'm Chris Biscardi. It's my Twitter handle. If you feel like asking me any questions about theming at all, um, feel free to reach out. Um, I am an independent consultant. I work with early stage startups, uh, mostly based in open source software. Um, my relationship to Gatsby, I have used the project since pre 1.0, um, and more recently I've been building out theming support uh, in the core product, and then I also build some plugins like Gatsby MDX integration and things like that. So themes, um, it's, it's an interesting word because um, everybody defines what a theme is slightly differently, right? We've got WordPress, where you've got child themes, which are basically like entire WordPress sites, right? Um, and then there's uh, Drupal, which also has a concept of themes that's very similar but slightly different. Um, and you've got a bunch of hooks that you can hook into, and themes can create other hooks that you can hook into. Um, and then products like Hugo also have a concept of themes, right? But the way that you use them is typically very different. You usually have a Git repo and then you like sub-module your theme in and it's just sort of like there because that's how Go projects work. Um, and then there's other people that talk about themes in terms of like, this is my light theme or this is my dark theme, which is really just like a set of design system tokens, right? So when we talk about themes in the Gatsby world, what we're effectively talking about, as I'll get into very soon, um, is entire Gatsby sites and how we chop up the functionality that composes your Gatsby site into individual pieces such that you can reuse them across projects. So, what is a Gatsby site? Um, what's the level of familiarity with like Gatsby in the room? Who has um, deployed multiple Gatsby sites? Who has written a plugin? Okay, who has no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> cool. Um, so a Gatsby site is basically made up of a few different things depending on how you chop them up. Um, in this case, we're gonna talk a little bit about sources, which are CMSs like Contentful, Drupal, WordPress, et cetera, even flat files on disk, right? We've got data types, uh, which are your Markdown, your MDX, your JSON, YAML, really any data you want, even unstructured data. Um, and then we've got this build process that allows us to take that data, transform that data, and turn it into an optimized, fast, offline, dynamic React app backed by static HTML. And then on top of all of that, we get these assets that are optimized, and then we want to push them somewhere. We want to push them to Netlify. We want to push them to S3. We want to push them anywhere, right? So if we look at those four things, they basically roughly correspond to a couple different types of plugins, right? If you look at the place that we get our data, those are source plugins, right? If you look at the way that we transform our data or the data types that we use in our CMSs, those are transformers. And then we have this longer tail of plugins for Gatsby that let you do things like uh, build offline manifests, um, add SaaS or CSS and JS solutions to style your application, um, really do anything that you can think of to a Gatsby site or to the build um, at any point. 
And then there's even more, right? There's more that goes into a Gatsby site. There's your brand. There's the components that are associated with your brand that maybe you're deploying as an NPM application or NPM package, right? There's the navigational structure. If you have five different documentation sites, you probably want all five of those code projects or whatever they are uh, to have a similar navigation so that when people hit each of your products, they know how to navigate already. And then there's the aggregation of your data, like how do you actually choose to display that in lists and pages and things like that. So to get a little bit more into it, um, sourcing data and using plugins involves a very simple operation, right? We just add something to the array of uh, the plugins field in our Gatsby config, right? This is a contentful source example. It's not really that difficult to do, right? Um, but we also don't want to do this in every project. If we're using uh, contentful in every project that we do, uh, we don't just want to like copy and paste this into every single application that we build. What we want to do is have this built in and then maybe pass in the token to access our contentful spaces and which space we're trying to access via an environment variable, right? So basically we want a standardized way that doesn't require writing additional code. And then we've got these transformers which are very, very similar, right? And they start out super simple. For example, if I have Markdown and I want to transform it into HTML, I can use the Remark transformer. And all that takes is adding the Remark transformer to my plugins list. But the Remark transformer has a lot of options. And maybe you want to copy and paste this across all of your different projects, or maybe you want to have a standardized configuration for how your company parses and transforms Markdown into HTML, right? Um, maybe you want Google Format Markdown across the board. Maybe you want to be uh, compatible with common mark, right? Use footnotes, not use footnotes. Um, and then there's a set of plugins that you can apply to other plugins, right? So you have your Gatsby Remark images um, and maybe your Sharp plugin to do the actual transformations. So these things also are fine if you're building a single site, you're building a blog, right? Um, for maybe personal use. But it, you know, it starts to get a little hairy when you start to have uh, two plus sites, two plus teams working on different sites. And it's, yeah, I mean, it works well for a single site and it doesn't work well for five, 10, 20 sites. And there's other things we can do on our Gatsby config too, right? There's the way that we encode relationships between our data. Maybe our CMS doesn't have support for linking different types of data together. So in our Gatsby config, we can say, okay, this uh, markdown front matter field is linked to this set of author YAML files that we actually have on disk, right? Maybe I'm getting these two from like Contentful and files on disk or WordPress and then Drupal because you know we're like moving ourselves over but we still wanna have our site deployed in the meantime. And then we get into sort of the longer tail of Gatsby plugins, right? We have uh, things like Topography JS. We have uh, Sharp, which is image manipulation, right? Uh, we can check our links to make sure they're valid. We can add offline support and manifest without having to write our own app manifest every single time. Um, we can add styling support for any of our preferred styling solutions like Emotion or SAS or Post CSS or whatever we want. And sort of what I'm getting at here is that we don't want to keep copying and pasting this across all of our applications, especially if those applications are in any way similar. So if you end up with a lot of configuration and you're trying to build multiple sites based on that configuration, uh, how do you do it? Well, as of like a month ago, it was still starters, right? Um, you do Gatsby new. It basically does a Git clone for you, deletes the Git repo and then says, here you go, have fun. Um, and this is great if you're starting a single site, right? But it's targeted at scaffolding, not reusability. So it fits a very nice use case, but it doesn't fit the use case that we're looking at for multiple sites that are similar. And starters are semi-updatable, right? 
if you want to pull down a new starter, you could pull down a new starter and keep the remote. And then the way that you update it later is sort of like, okay, I'm gonna do a git pull and hopefully I haven't changed too much and it's not too much of a hassle to actually like merge that in uh, from the remote and then rebase everything on top. Or you just never update ever again. And starters tend to be collections of isolated behavior, right? Um, you have a single purpose starter, right? There's your blog starter, which is sort of an all-in-one solution for getting your blog started. There's the Netlify CMS starter, which you know isn't necessarily an entire site for you, but it gives you the Netlify CMS by default, so you don't have to think about it. And then you have to build everything else. There's the Bootstrap starter, which similar thing, right? It gives you this front-end framework, but it's not a complete site. Um, and then things like authentication, right? Same thing. So starters um, are good. They solve a very good uh, scaffolding use case. But the use case that we're looking at here is reusability. How do we build five sites? How do we build 10 sites? How do we scale the creation of sites that rely on similar configuration? And uh, really good use cases for these would be a set of similar marketing sites, right? You have five different products. You have 10 different products. You want them to look very much the same, uh, but you know, this one's got a blue primary brand color and that one's got a purple primary brand color. Um, you've got documentation, same thing. You have uh, 15 different code projects and you want them all documented and you want them all displayed similarly with similar navigations. How do you do that without having 15 different sites? And then say you have uh, an application that people are using, um, what do you do for your support team? What do you do for the admins that are performing admin actions on these applications? Do you just ship it all as one? Or maybe you ship three different apps. So what's next? What do we do after starters? Um, if we're saying that starters aren't really good enough for this reuse use case, how do we get to a point beyond starters where we're able to reuse our config, our logic, the components that we use to construct our render paths. Um, how do we override things, right? And still make it such like, make it so that we have a create React app type experience, right? Where we can upgrade and we don't have to worry too much about what we changed, right? Because we're doing the up overrides in a way that is composable, that doesn't delete a bunch of code. How do we extend things with additional logic, right? So maybe our blogs usually have a uh, markdown, but you know, this next blog that we're doing is the developer blog, and uh, our developers are really front-end people. So maybe we use MD MDX so that we can use React components inside of our blog content, right? And this is probably obvious, but I'm going to tell you this is the solution. <laughs> So to get there, we sort of have to look at um, what we just looked at, what makes a, Gats a single Gatsby site, and take that and wa say, what can we do to make that multiple Gatsby sites in one, basically, right? Um, and the Gatsby config is, as we just said, plugins, mappings, site metadata, the path prefix, a couple other things. And it's the core data structure that controls the functionality of our Gatsby site. Right? And since that works so well for a single site, why do we, we try to reuse that for multiple sites? What if we could just compose Gatsby configs? What if we had a Gatsby config that uh, detailed the URL structure of our blogs, the format that we wanted our blog posts in, and the way that we rendered our blog pages? What if we had one that encapsulated our entire marketing site and then you could just override the index page because you know maybe it just doesn't work for the new product, right? Then you're just overriding one page instead of overriding the entire thing. Maybe you just want to encapsulate the way that you access your data sources, right? You have a standardized way of accessing Drupal applications. Um, you have a standardized way of getting to Contentful. You can encode that in a theme and then expose, say, a couple environment variables and now you have a reusable way without having everybody 
copy and paste code all over the place to access the data that you repeatedly access. And maybe you just want to take that remark config that we saw earlier and uh, stuff it somewhere and make sure that everybody isn't using their own remark config in every different project. So this is themes. This is how you use a theme. Uh, this is the minimum possible Gatsby config that gives you a working site. Right, so just to impress that upon you, you need uh, three lines of code including a bracket. <laughs> right, and you have a functioning block. Um, and the Gatsby config for a theme can be as monolithic or as modular as you want it to, which means that it's basically just, see if I can click here and scroll, it's just a, a Gatsby site, right? It's just a Gatsby config. It's the same thing that you expect, it's the same thing you work with every day. You know, the only real difference between this and a regular Gatsby config is instead of using path.resolve, you probably use require.resolve because it'll be in an NPM module. Well. So themes, uh, sometimes you need to parameterize them, right? You have a theme. Like I said before, maybe you want it to be just the brand color, right? Everything else is the same except the brand color. Maybe this value here is the brand color, and then you stick that into your theme, and you can use that when you're creating all of the different templates and stuff for your theme. And again, uh, it's just a Gatsby site, so it's the same way that you construct any other Gatsby site, and the same way any other plugin takes an option. Which brings me to the next point, why would a theme take options, and how would it use it? Themes are also plugins. So you get access to Gatsby Node, you get access to Gatsby SSR, you get access to Gatsby Browser, um, and you can encode any logic that you want, create pages, any of the life cycles, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's just a Gatsby site, um, which I will say a couple more times before I'm finished. So if we look at the sort of uh, items that we wanted after starters, this is what we've already accomplished, just through composing Gatsby configs. The last thing we need is sort of like the ability to override components, et cetera. And that's where component shadowing comes in. Component shadowing is how we handle overriding a specific component that handles the rendering of a specific part of our application, right? So let's say you have a bio component. If anybody, uh, who's looked at the Gatsby blog starter or used it when they were experimenting? Yeah, okay. So there's a bio component in here. Um, and the bio component has a certain person's name hard-coded with their photo, Kyle. <laughs> Um, my guess is you are not Kyle. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong later. Um, if you want to override that bio component, this is how you do it. You have source components bio.js, which is the file and the theme. And in your site, you have source components Gatsby theme blog bio. That's it. You've now replaced the entire bio component anywhere it's imported. Could you say that again? Yes. So, Gatsby projects usually have a folder called source components, right? And inside of that folder, you have a number of components that you use to build your site up. In this case, the blog starter has a bio component in that folder. The way that you override that bio component, so it's just a React component, takes props, returns JSX, is you create a single new file that is just a React component that is exported in the same way as the original component. So all you've done here is you've created a React component in a specific location, which is a subdirectory of your site, and it is done for you. So now that we've sort of established that it's, it's easy to replace things like a single bio component, or maybe more realistically, uh, the navigation element, or the way that a blog post renders, uh, let, like, what can we shadow? What can we actually do with this feature? Um, and we can shadow components like we just talked about. 
We can split out our query components with our static queries, and we can change the way that we get data into our new components. This gives rise to new patterns uh, in Gatsby, right? So before, page templates usually had a page query and the component in the same file. With component shadowing, we can split that query and the component up, put the component in source components, and now, across all of your different documentation sites, you can just replace a single React component, get the same data, but render it completely differently. So you're allowing people who don't have the knowledge of GraphQL to use the same data model that you defined in your theme, and all they have to do is know how to write a React component. And then design tokens, right? That's the light versus dark, right? You've got a theme over here and a theme over there, and this one is your marketing site for people who really like light and white and things like that, and this one is, you know, uh, that dang developer that just, like, really likes dark themes and won't let it go. Um, that's me. Um, and really, this is any file, right? So I've just listed a couple of use cases. Um, but anything that you can think of that you can represent as a file, you can stick in this directory and you can override later in your site, right? So I'm assuming that you all will have more ideas than I have about how to use that. Um, but anything that goes into your webpack bundle can be replaced by introducing a single file. So for example, uh, going back to the bio component, Let's say we wanted to override it. This is how we would do that. We create a single file in a specific location and export the React component. And it's just used anywhere that bio component is used. This would be, I don't think I can scroll. I, don't, I think the last thing is only a bracket anyway. Yes, so the file name, so if I have Gatsby theme blog, I'll go back, right? If my theme is Gatsby theme blog, and I have a file in that theme that's like an NPM package or something uh, that is source components bio. In my site, if I write source components theme name component, it will replace that. Um, and this is standard across all themes, so if you use, by the way, I didn't mention it before, but that themes config in the Gatsby config is an array. So you can include as many themes as you want. You can split this up as modularly as you want to and compose them together. This is the idea of composable Gatsby configs. So yeah, it's a file name based replacement methodology, right? So yeah, here's the pattern I was just talking about. Um, we can import our render component for a page template for our create pages call. We can keep the page query in that template because it needs to be there for Gatsby reasons. Um, and this lets, so this file is in your theme. And then this lets any user override the way that a blog post renders using a single file, right? And this enables like upgrades, right? Now you've just overridden one file. When you go to upgrade your theme to the next version, uh, you don't have to worry about like, okay, did the data model change, right? You can check the GraphQL query in this against the last one and know if it changed, right? And then the same thing for tokens, for example, right? Like maybe we have a bunch of colors, spacing variables, media queries, things like that, um, and they're all files in our theme. Uh, we can replace any one of them individually, like just replace the colors or just replace the spacing. Um, or we can replace them all by replacing that index file, right? Because it re-exports them. So you can swap brands by replacing a single file, right? The entire theme, the entire color scheme, the spacing, media queries, et cetera, of your site can change by changing a single file. And with themes, there's this idea of uh, progressive disclosure. And what I mean by progressive disclosure is that there is a user who is early in their Gatsby career, right? They're saying, okay, I, I know some React. Um, 
maybe I don't really know React and I just want to create markdown files, they can just create this one Gatsby config and start blogging, right? Maybe I know some React and I want to change the bio component or the navigation or the way blog posts render. Then I'm just creating a React component, right? So it's a little bit more complicated than just creating that Gatsby config, but it gets them more, like they get more power. And this goes up and goes up and goes up until you start hitting life cycles, right? If I want to change the query for a blog post and add data to it or change the data model, I now go look at the onCreate page Gatsby lifecycle call. And this scales up into creating your own themes, creating your own plugins. So the more that you want to do and the more that you want to change brings you closer progressively in a way that lets you learn at a nice pace and doesn't throw you off a cliff. Um, and this onboards you into creating your own themes in the end. Or maybe you don't need to get there ever. Maybe you're just a user of somebody else's. So talking about life cycles, um, there's a number of life cycles uh, in Gatsby, right? Um, who is familiar with all of the Gatsby life cycles, or at least some of them? Yes. Okay, so these exist, because <laughs> um, not many people raise their hands. Um, when you start a Gatsby build, uh, you get to bootstrap stuff, it sources these nodes that you're querying all over the place, uh, you get some resolvable extensions for like creating pages and source pages, uh, there's create pages which are programmatically generated pages and paths and components, um, you can uh, alter the way that Gatsby extracts queries from your components, and then when everything's done you can do whatever you want afterwards, right? So for example, on pre-bootstrap is like the first one that will ever be called. And basically nothing has happened at this point. And this isn't used a lot in plugins, but it can be used to create a better user experience in your theme, right? So you have a Gatsby source file system plugin, right? And that relies on a specific location on disk for you to put your markdown files. You can make dir-p basically um, or ensure this directory exists so that when somebody uses your theme, if the directory isn't there, boom, when they run it, it's there. It doesn't throw an error, they don't have to worry about it, they don't have to think about it. It's just there. And that's this example, right? So we get the program directory from Gatsby. We say, okay, we have source pages and we're looking in there for markdown files. Um, we know that because we created the theme, right? We check to see if it exists. If source pages doesn't exist, we create it. And now nobody that uses our theme needs to worry about it ever again, right? It'll just be there when they run the theme. And then sort of talking about more of the um, leveling up, this is a, another one of the life cycles, right? So whenever somebody runs create pages, um, maybe in your theme or whatever, and then the user wants to say, uh, start taking control of bigger pieces, right? So taking control of the data structures that they are querying. You start using onCreate page. So every time a page is created, onCreate page gets called, which means that you can now check to see if it's the component from the theme and replace it with your own, right? And your own will have your own page query, et cetera. And you, it can be anything you want, right? So basically what I want to get out of this is um, if you ever build a starter, start building a theme um, and then ask me questions and you know, if you run into problems, yell at me. This is my call to action by the way. I'm just gonna take a drink and leave it here for a second. <laughs> Yeah, and then um, that's, that's basically it for themes, right? So these are a couple of useful links if you are interested in this, if you are interested in theming, if your theming sounds like something you want to either use or start creating, et cetera. Uh, the top link is the theme examples I'm about to actually physically show you. Um, and then the Spectrum chat is where we're handling sort of community communication around this feature, which I have to say, is experimental currently, but does have everything that I just talked about in this talk. So I'm going to change my display settings so that we can take a look. I have a couple of minutes left here. All 
No, that's because I... Why would I disconnect it? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, he's gonna mirror. Great. Can anybody see this? Great. Um, I was a little worried that was gonna be really washed out. So this is the repo that I was just talking about. There's a themes directory and a UI surfaces directory. The themes directory is where this Gatsby theme blog that I've been talking about through this presentation lives. You can look at the implementation. You can look at what I've done. You can look at the path that we took from nothing to the actual theme implementation if you want to. Um, I'm not gonna look at that right now. Wow, that doesn't persist across panes. That's annoying. <laughs> Emacs, man. Like, why do I even use it? Um, yeah, so this is a theme usage, right? There's a Gatsby config. There's the package.json that declares the dependencies. And there is a source folder. This is the minimal possible usage of a theme. That means there is a theme in the Gatsby config and some options. The options are sort of, uh, you can ignore those. And then the source folder, there's pages and assets. Assets is a favicon, and that's it. And pages is just my markdown files and Directories. I, I missed something. Is this going into the plugin of a starter to be a theme within something? I, I missed so, like the theme gets into uh, Gatsby New. So themes and starters are different, right? Yeah. So uh, a theme is basically a Gatsby site that you can reuse, right? A starter you can use to scaffold. So, for example. Um, if you look at the package.json here, I, I right. I, I don't know what we're looking at right now. That's what I'm trying to explain. Oh, sorry. Right. So what we're looking at right now is a user's site. Somebody that's using your theme. So you publish this Gatsby theme blog. Okay. There is a package.json here that specifies, hey, I want to use Gatsby in the blog theme. Right. We are within a theme right now. We're within a user's site right now. This is how you know we're in a user site. It's just using our theme. All we need is the package.json that specifies. So this is the Gatsby config in somebody's site. Yep. With these three or four lines. Yes. Okay. Um, and that's that's it. That's you're using the theme blog theme, right? Okay. So the package.json says we want it, and this is how we tell Gatsby that we want to use it. Got it. Of course. Um, and then I'll go, not to be super confusing, since I only have another minute or two, uh, and I want to answer some questions. Um, if you followed the component shadowing example, this is the way that you shadow components, right? And then you just have the, that's really small. I need to learn how that works better. Um, yeah, and you just export your component and it shadows the pile component. Um, yeah, and after that I will answer questions. Recording stopped. Oh, that's so annoying. Okay, anyway.